And many of you may have uh, read or seen our story with my daughter, Brooke Adams. Uh, she takes cannabis to control her seizures at school. The school district would not allow her to have it at school, and so we fought that and won our case last September. So she does attend school. <laughs> with her cannabis medicine, it's her rescue medication. Just like an EpiPen, she needs it. So she's hope, hope, hopefully we're setting a trend or a, an allowance for other children to access as well. Many other states have already passed bills, and that's in the horizon as well. Um, Dr. Bonnie Goldstein is Brooke's doctor for cannabis, and um, when we first found out that she was an amazing doctor that could explain everything to us in understandable terms, I searched her out and um, started to take Brooke to see her. And I knew that once, once we were able to get in a place where Brooke is a little more stable, that I wanted to have the opportunity to bring this information to other people so that they could have this opportunity to give to their kids instead of medications that had intubated Brooke, had put her in the hospital numerous times. And with cannabis, actually August 2016 is the last time she's been in the ER for status seizure because of cannabis. Uh, so we are Whole Plant Access for Autism. Um, my name is Rhonda, as she mentioned. So a little bit about our organization. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. We actually started um, the nonprofit last year, so we're only about a year old at this point. Uh, we work with families and kind of help educate them about how to use cannabis, how to, um, how the benefits for specifically autism and other comorbid conditions. We also work with individuals and organizations within the cannabis industry, um, also the medical field and researchers. Founded by two moms, myself and my partner Jenny, who's over there. Um, we both have children on the spectrum. We've both been using cannabis for years at this point, and we both have found success with using cannabis um, over pharmaceuticals. So we also, for education and outreach, we provide people with infographics to make things more visual for them. A lot of times people don't want to read a 15-page research article, and I get that. So we take that information, we try and put it into a visual for people to understand. So that's up here. Um, we also provide them information about the cannabinoids, um, what they do. We do webinars. Um, and we also go to various events like this and we present or we have booths to give out our information. We also have a website and it's kind of hard to see, but we do have a members area that we have where we pay a small fee, it all goes towards a nonprofit. And these are all educational files that we have that you can access once you pay that small fee and that helps again support the nonprofit. We had a poll in our support group. How many of, of the families in the support group, how many of you found a product on the first try that worked for your condition? I think only 50% said one. The rest were between two and six products before they found something that worked for their condition. So. You can go, and I do still advise to go through all these check marks, make sure the product is safe, make sure it's clean, make sure it's something that's gonna work for you long term, but also you have to, it has to work. It has to work. Um, there's a product that we um, love in our support group. It has a really great discount for families with disabilities. Um, it works for a lot of our families, but it doesn't work for my child. And so even though it's a great price point, and I wish I could, afford, I could buy that one and, and, buy, and I could afford that all day long, I have to actually buy something that's a little bit more expensive because that's what works for my child. So instead of paying two cents a milligram for CBD, I have to pay about five cents a milligram. But it's what's the best interest of my child and I will fork it out because it works the best. So I mean, still do your research, but at the end of the day, does it work? If it doesn't work, 
don't give up because there are, like I said, families that find two, three, after the fourth or fifth product, now they find something that works for them. So sometimes it does take a little bit of trial and error, trying different things before you find something that fits your needs. I think it's so important for people to get information, uh, credible information. The internet's great, but sometimes there's stuff on there that's just shocking. And uh, if you're making a decision for your health, uh, for your child's health, for your family member's health, it's important to have good information. This is one of the things I love about what I do is that I do get to just take the info. I'm a total science geek, so I totally geek out on this stuff. And then I like to break it down and then share it with everybody else. Because if we have knowledge, you have power. If you have power over your own health, you're going to make good decisions and you're going to be able to reap the benefits of this wonderful plant. A friend of mine got sick, but she asked me about medical cannabis and I didn't know anything other than, oh yeah, there's this law and oh yeah, we used it back in college. So I decided to delve into the science to see if there really was something there. I hadn't dismissed it and I do find a lot of my uh, doctor colleagues dismiss it immediately. They refuse to say, is there something here? But hopefully, you know, things are changing for the better in terms of my colleagues. But I looked into it because my friend was really sick and I couldn't believe what I was reading in the scientific literature. Everybody says there's not enough research and that's true, but there is plenty of research to know that it is safe. They have been trying to find all the negative things for years. Remember, we live in a country where you're allowed to research cannabis for its detrimental effects, but you are not allowed to look for benefits. That's our where we are now in 2019 as a Schedule One drug. You have to jump through a thousand hoops to look for benefits. Our youngest patient's six weeks old, and I would have started him on cannabis at three days, but we didn't have the proper diagnosis, so we needed to wait. And my oldest patient was 100. I did a house call for her. If you had seen the box of medicines, it was unbelievable. 27 different medications at the end of life. Makes no sense. Uh, we have a changing demographic. Back in, when I started doing this in 2008, it was mostly people already using cannabis, had found good relief, and then just wanted to be part of a legal system. Now what it appears is that it's mostly people who are cannabis naive, who have already tried pharmaceuticals, have researched online, and now are trying to find something more natural or something that works a little bit better for them. 85% of our patients that come in have already tried conventional medication. It's not a first, it's still in this day not considered first line for many conditions and people do follow the advice of their doctors and then find out that they're really unhappy with their medication. But you have to remember that shortly after um, um, 1964 we have the Controlled Substance Act that goes into effect here in the United States and effectively shuts down a lot of research. Uh, in 1970, it was put on the Schedule One, which it still is. I'm not allowed to write a prescription for cannabis. I'm allowed to write a recommendation. Uh, Schedule One means no medicinal value. That's not true. Uh, high abuse potential, that's not true. And lack of safety, and we know that's not true. So cannabis does not fit any of those criteria where it still lives. Anyway, it took a long time to figure out, yes, we know THC causes the high, but how does it cause the high? And in 1988, there was a major scientific breakthrough uh, by, led by a uh, female scientist at St. Louis University. I'll go into that. And then shortly after that, another uh, breakthrough, which was the discovery of the endocannabinoid system and endocannabinoids. So discovery of THC, I've already mentioned. They isolated THC as, a, as the intoxicating compound, but the mechanism of how THC worked, did, it was 24 years before they figured out exactly how THC works in your brain. Remember, in 1988, we have the Schedule uh, One in place. You cannot research natural cannabis. So they took synthetic THC, and they put radioactive dye attached to it, and they followed it in a rat's brain. And every single time, there we go. Can you guys see that? Every single time, here's the, pretend this is the THC with radioactive dye. It went, you know, in through uh, the bloodstream and then it would attach to this, what we call the receptor. At the time, it wasn't called the cannabinoid receptor. Scientists knew about that receptor and it was called an orphan receptor. Think of a receptor as a lock and the chemical compound that binds to it is the key, okay? So, 
This receptor was called an orphan receptor because they did not know what compounds were binding to it. It had been seen in the scientific literature. It had been seen on electron microscope. Scientists knew it was there, but they didn't know its function. Lo and behold, we give THC to rats with radioactive dye, and THC sticks onto that receptor. Every receptor you have in your body, you make the key for. Dopamine receptor, you make dopamine. Serotonin receptor, you make serotonin. Opioid receptor, okay, you don't make Vicodin, you make <laughs> endorphins, right? So every receptor system is set up that there is a chemical, which is the key, and the receptor, which is the lock. So the scientists knew, here we have this receptor, we're calling it an orphan receptor, but THC binds to it. THC is a cannabinoid. We're going to call it a cannabinoid receptor. But guess what? We must make something within our brains or bodies that binds to that receptor, and they went in search of. And it took them four years, and they discovered that the cell kind of at the, at connected or on the receiving end of a message, and I'll go over that in a second, makes a cannabinoid-like compound to go back up and stick to that receptor. We do not have these receptors for THC in the plant. We have them because we make our own inner cannabis. We make our own inner THC. Everybody in here makes it. So if you've ever seen anybody who's violently ill from cannabis, uh, I'm sorry, from a chemo or a migraine headache where they're throwing up, they literally take a puff and they're better, right? It's not magic what's happening. And what's happening is that THC, as you can see here, is binding to the receptor. This receptor's meant for our own inner cannabinoid-like compounds, but sometimes we don't make enough of those or we've used them up and you can override with cannabis. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, it's just a feedback loop. I like to use the analogy, if you are a type 1 diabetic, you, your pancreas stops, the cells get damaged and your pancreas stops making insulin. Where do you have to take your insulin from? An external source. If your thyroid poops out on you and you have low thyroid, hypothyroidism, I bet you there's a lot of people in here who have to take thyroid medicine because it's fairly common. What do you, you take thyroid medicine to replace. So when you take cannabis, you're augmenting or replacing the cannabinoids that you already make. This is why there's so few side effects. We have a system that is set up to handle these compounds, okay? So what we like to say about cannabis is this, uh, the endocannabinoid system is it's a signaling system that sends messages to promote balance. So the goal is this cell sending too much let me tell it to dial down, get back into balance. One last thing I want to say is that many people are confused about hemp versus marijuana. Raise your hand if you're confused and you need an explanation. Okay, so our federal government says 0.3% THC by weight and under is hemp, okay? But that's not really what defines hemp, okay? Just that number, they're using that number alone to define hemp, and that is not what defines hemp, right? You're shaking your head, you get it. So there is a lot of CBD on the market that has lower than 0.3%, that is whole plant, very robust. It is a drug variety plant, not a fiber variety. So fiber variety is hemp, drug variety is what we would call, like our government wants to call marijuana, right? Make it illegal. Hemp is allowed, marijuana is not. So drug variety by definition is, quote, illegal federally. But if you grow your drug variety plant low in THC, guess what you can call it and sell it as? Hemp. So I call it drug variety, medicine variety, masquerading as hemp. Because it's that definition of, oh, it's 0.29. Oh, now I can sell it to whoever I want on the internet. Does that make sense to everybody? If it's over 0.3, by definition, by our federal definition, it's a marijuana plant. It is a drug variety, it's federally illegal. If it's under 0.3, and you may find it in a dispensary under 0.3 because the person marketing that or the, the manufacturer says, no, I want this. This happens to be a medical marijuana plant that I grew as medical marijuana, but it tested out under 0.3. And now I could call it hemp, but I'm going to call it so I'm going to call it marijuana and sell it in the dispensary. But they don't have to; they could put a label on it that says hemp. 
When you see hemp on a bottle, that means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. You must see what's inside the bottle with a test result. Okay, if you get a test result and everything is ND, not detected, not detected, not detected, and there's a teensy weensy little bit of CBD, guess what it is? It's either isolate or it's a hemp or it's a, a hemp variety maybe, you know, that they're growing really low on everything else and it really is truly the fiber variety. I joke around that back in the day they used to say, don't smoke rope, smoke dope, okay? <laughs> Does that help everybody? You want medicine. It shouldn't be illegal, but unfortunately that's where we are, but you want medicine variety. Can, quote, hemp help some people? Yes, hemp oil. I put hemp seeds in my smoothies. We eat hemp hearts in my house. We have hemp milk. We have hemp, all, it's a great nutritional value, great source of fatty acids for your brain. But for medicine, I want whole plant, robust cannabinoids, terpenes, and all of that. And the only way to know what's in that bottle is to get a test result. If somebody says it's proprietary, move on, okay? Um, that's all I have, thank you. Because I suffered a stroke, a massive stroke in 2006. You could see the white area of my brain that doesn't exist anymore. That's in the cerebellum. I lost about a third of my cerebellum. Um, and it, it, cerebellum stroke is a bit unusual compared to what we usually think of as strokes. In the cortex, you, you suffer a, a language uh, decrements and so forth. It's not the case with the cerebellum. Um, you're more likely to die, um, but if you recover, uh, if, you, if you endure it, you, your recovery, you don't suffer the same kind of deficits you ordinarily think of with a stroke. So um, this was in 2006. I'm not going to go into a story about what happened to me personally. I mean, cannabis was very helpful. I, I want to talk more in general uh, what we know about um, cannabis and strokes and, um, and TBI. This is, um, and I'll share a few, few um, science papers. This is from 2014. Um, and the, this is looking at the effect of marijuana use on people who have strokes. And basically what they found is that you're more likely to survive and have a better outcome if you're a marijuana user. Um, so the, the, the quote from marijuana use is associated with decreased mortality in adult patients sustaining TB, TBI. And what they refer to now is THC-rich uh, cannabis. They were, they were looking for, uh, you know, they would do a screening and, and who, had, who had what in that regard. So um, why? Why is this the case? Well, to go back to a, a foundational uh, uh, science study published in 1998, um, which has been um, uh, very significant, that it, it formed the basis of, of a patent that the US government uh, uh, claimed on the uh, antioxidant neuroprotective effects of cannabinoids. This has been misrepresented by the CBD industry as a patent on CBD. This was a patent that the government took out, um, but based on cannabinoid research, both THC and, and, and CBD. Um, so I should point out that this particular study was done by scientists associated by the National Institute of Health. There were four scientists who authored this paper, including a Nobel laureate. So this is a very important study, and as I mentioned, formed the basis of this patent, which specifically mentioned that cannab cannabinoids have applications as neuroprotection in limiting neurological damage following ischemic insults, such as stroke and uh, trauma, and many other neurological diseases. This is a, a, a scientific study looking at impact of cannabinoids on dementia as having an anti-dementia effect. And it says, cannabinoids protect neurons on the molecular level. The progression of brain aging and the pathogenesis of uh, neurogenic diseases are suppressed by cannabinoids. Um, this is not a controversial thing in science. This is understood to be the case. Um, what's interesting is if you go back about 5,000 years, the ancient Chinese said the same thing. And the first medical text ever assembled by humankind, uh, the first uh, pharmacopoeia, um, when referring to cannabis, which was described as one of the supreme elixirs of immortality, said to confer longevity, you see from the medical text, protect, protracted taking may make one fat strong and never senile. That's the key part. So somehow they knew back then what we're just figuring out today and with all our modern science. 
Okay, so the question is, so why, well, why is this? So how does this happen? What, what's the gist? And as, as Bonnie and others have pointed out, essentially what the cannabinoids do, the plant cannabinoids, they augment and um, uh, uh, mimic the effects of the endogenous compounds, the endogenous cannabinoids. And the endogenous compounds are part of the endocannabinoid system. <laughs> After trying different things and after trying uh, what didn't work, Aubrey has changed her diet on her own. She's more on a carnivore diet uh, or a modified keto, so it's mostly meat and some vegetables and almost no um, carbs. And uh, she recently cut out all of her sugars. And I tell you what, that was a game changer for us. It, she went from having a lot of auras, um, and if you know what that is, and it means you're going to have a seizure, you're going to have a seizure, you're going to have a seizure, your body's telling you, uh, to she doesn't have those auras now. Um, are we seizure free? Not quite yet. But another thing that I really want to touch on is the emotional healing. Um, when you have been dealing with uh, seizures that will put you in the hospital or nearly kill you, uh, there's a lot of emotional trauma that you have to deal with. And Aubrey is uh, doing that, you know, she's uh, seeing psychologists, she also um, consults with friends, I've taught her how to tap, occasionally she'll do it, um, but she manages her stress as best that she can, and emotional healing is a big part of the overall total body. Um, and I will say that, you know, cannabis is uh, fantastic, it's wonderful, but it is the gateway to learning how to manage your own body, and that means whole body, that means everything that goes in it, food, starting with food, and cannabis is just part of it. And one of the things I think is really important for everybody to remember is that notwithstanding Prop 64, and notwithstanding adult use legalization and your ability to go to a retailer and to get cannabis and cannabis products, it's still really, really important for you to uh, get a recommendation for your child if your child is being treated. And that's one of the things I think is really easy to overlook is with all of the new laws and all of the new protections that you have as adults, um, those don't carry through with adults providing cannabis to children, even if it's really, really valid. Um, if you are not a caregiver, if the child is not a patient. And so that's a really important thing that, that I thought it would be important to just sort of state and restate here today. Um, so here in California, there are a handful of doctors that are involved in a group called Society of Cannabis Clinicians. The website is cannabisclinicians.org. Org, I think, or .com, but try cannabisclinicians.org or .com. And that is a group that I belong to that a number of other doctors belong to who, you know, are doing more dosing, uh, more advising. Luckily, th the pool of physicians who are doing this is getting larger. So there are a lot of um, doctors both in Northern and Southern California that are um, part of that group. and. Um, out, out of state, so if you have any loved ones out of state, I often refer people to Realm of Caring in Colorado, who they're a nonprofit as well, and they keep a list of physicians who are in any state. So there's doctors in New York, and um, you know, uh, apparently in Tennessee and Oklahoma now, there's some doctors doing this, Florida, and so on. So Realm of Caring, I think it's roc.us is their website, or the roc.us, and they also keep a list. You might have to call them to get that list. And after we got here, it was a while before I dialed into the fact that we needed CBD, believe it or not. Um, but once I put her on it, it was about a six month period. It took about six months and I saw the light bulb go off, go on. And I saw some cognitive uh, repair. I saw her eyes get brighter. There were, she was reconnecting in, in areas that I hadn't seen happen. Um, so it, 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 sometimes it does take time. And, and even now, um, with her changing her diet um, and not eating so much Chick-fil-A and, and she was, had a big sugar addiction, when she got the sugar out of her system, I, I saw another marked difference with her cognitive ability.
was really I was really excited about the panel today. They provided some great information, especially for those families that are still trying to navigate and find good resources and good information to help their kids or patients. The reason we went public with my daughter Brooke Adams' story was to help others realize that they are not the only ones looking for this solution. Uh, we wanted to provide kind of a resource supportive um, link to families looking for non-pharmaceutical directions or maybe they hadn't uh, gotten pharmaceuticals to work for their situation and then what do you do when the doctor says we can add five or six more you know medications you know it's at that point where we said no we're gonna try cannabis and it's through other families that I was able to investigate and find that cannabis could work for my daughter as well and that was the whole point of this symposium to provide that same support and resource that I received when my daughter was just barely a year old. She's been taking cannabis since she was 15 months old and now she's six. So it's a journey and we hope that this will provide a link and a support system for all families looking to get help through cannabis.